Welcome to Seniors Decide 2016. I'm Max Richman, uh, Chair of the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations. Uh, we're a coalition of 72 organizations representing the interests and needs of America's seniors, their caregivers, and their families. This is the first and I think the only national forum uh, dedicated to the views of presidential candidates on issues affecting older Americans. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizations that contributed financially to make this forum possible. Uh, AARP, Compassion and Choices, and the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the members of our task force, our LCAO task force, that worked tirelessly, I know because I saw them in the office a lot, uh, to put on this event. And special thanks to Julie Tippins and Alan Lopatin. They made the, they really made this happen. Finally, I'd like to thank our media partner, uh, Next Avenue, and uh, we'll hear from them in a few minutes uh, for uh, its support and contributions uh, for, of its online readers uh, to the questions we receive from all over the country. Now we ask members of LCAO and their community partners to submit questions for the candidates. And we have received, I can hardly believe this myself, over 1,400 questions. We're not going to ask each one of them, don't, don't worry. Uh, uh, for everyone here and everyone watching uh, online in a watch party, and uh, there are over 100 watch parties, uh, I think 114 or so. Uh, you all have contributed to what we will hear today from the candidates um, and their representatives. The questions came to us through Seniors Decide website, also through AARP's Take a Stand, and through Next Avenue's outreach to its very extensive online community. And because we have a large online audience, uh, I'm hope asking and encouraging the audience to use the hashtag pound seniors decide as you share uh, any comments today. Now, we are live streaming today. Uh, so I'll ask our live audience here to please keep down the noise and the remarks about what is said today. Of course, if you really like something that's being said, you can applaud. I hope you do. So we, before we go to the first campaign, I thought it would be a, enlightening for us to hear uh, from our two special guests, hear some insight about what is driving seniors' decisions as they get ready to vote this year. So, you know, we call the, this Seniors Forum Seniors Decide 2016 because we know, and you know, older Americans are consistent and well-informed voters. They vote in very high numbers. And they'll affect the outcome of uh, this very important election. So we've asked two people with uh, public opinion polling expertise to join us here today and share their analysis and tell us what's on the minds of older voters that will be influencing their decisions. I'll introduce them both uh, at the same time and ask uh, Jonathan Boss to begin. Jonathan uh, is a partner at Lake Research Partners. Uh, he's been a partner uh, for four years uh, as, an, as a senior analyst and uh, currently uh, serves as vice president, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Jonathan is a trained focus group moderator. He works on a variety of issues for Lake Research, uh, including uh, economic issues, environmental issues, uh, and issues involving children's access to public education, and ensuring that people can retire in dignity. Before joining Lake Research, Jonathan worked at uh, Benenson Strategy Group and the Feldman Group and conducted research across the country for a number of congressional and statewide uh, campaigns and ballot initiatives. And uh, Jonathan has provided some very strategic guidance for campaigns issue coalitions, corporations, and nonprofit organizations, including the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Jonathan's from uh, Orange County, New York. Uh, he started working on political campaigns as a college student 
has a master's in public administration from NYU and a bachelor's degree in politics also from NYU. And we thank you for being here and we thank Bob Carpenter for joining us. Thanks for coming in from Naples. Uh, uh, Bob is with uh, Chesapeake Beach Consulting. Prior to founding this, his own firm, he spent 18 years at American Viewpoint where he was vice president. He has extensive experience in both qualitative and quantitative research, conducting polls, focus groups for Republican candidates. This is a bipartisan, nonpartisan, uh, one of those uh, group. Uh, uh, for candidates for federal and state office, as well as companies and organizations uh, ranging from na na nature conservancy to the human rights campaign. And has also uh, worked on uh, uh, Republican Party organizations in California, Alaska, Michigan. Now Bob serves in local office himself as a member of the Chesapeake Beach Town Council, so he has firsthand experience in managing uh, budgets and delivering services. Uh, thank you both for uh, being here. Uh, we look forward to your insights. And uh, John, we'll start with you. Well, thank you very much for, for having me today and having us today uh, provide our uh, sense of what's gone on so far in the, the race for president, um, what we can expect to come, and uh, how seniors, um, what issues are important to them as this election uh, heats up. Uh, very happy to be here today on behalf of Lake Research Partners. Um, as Max said, we have done work, actually Bob and I together, on behalf of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare um, for a number of years. So very happy to be here today with a live audience and an, an audience joining us on the web. So to start, in terms of the Democratic race and what's gone on so far and what's going on, um, based on what's happened in Iowa and what's happened in New Hampshire, there's a couple clear trends that are emerging thus far. So first. Hillary performs best with older voters, um, those who care about the right experience for what the next president should have, um, those who have higher concerns about electability, and those who want to continue President Obama's policies. Those are based on entrance polls from Iowa and exit polls from New Hampshire. Um, she does better with women than, than she does with men, although um, Bernie did carry women 55 to 44 in New Hampshire, um, but she outperformed amongst women compared to men as well. Um, Senator Sanders performs best with young voters. To, to give you a sense of just how well he performed in Iowa, for example, uh, he won around 84 percent, um, uh, 86 between age 17 and 24, 81 between 25 and 29. Um, so the under 30 crowd, 84 percent went for Bernie Sanders. President Obama won millennials in 2008 as well, and that was very famous as part of kind of the, the, the headline coming out of Iowa. 56 percent of millennials, of voters under 30, excuse me. Um, voted for President Obama in 2008. So to go from 56% to 84% is a dramatic uh, increase in performance um, that Senator Sanders did in Iowa. And he continued that uh, in New Hampshire, winning 83% of the vote from uh, voters aged 18 to 29. So that's certainly one of his strengths. Older voters, however, are one of his weaknesses. Um, among seniors, 55% in New Hampshire went for Hillary to 44% for Senator Sanders. In terms of attributes, uh, Bernie supporters care about income inequality above, above all else. Um, being outside the establishment, that is a characteristic and a candidate for president that they want. Um, he gets better marks for honesty and trustworthiness at the moment than Hillary Clinton does, and also those who want the next president to be more liberal um, than President Obama. So there are some clear cleavages within the Democratic primary electorate that are emerging as this primary campaign goes on. Um, and, you know, one of the frustrating things about being a pollster is kind of the expectation that we have a crystal ball. Uh, I do not pretend to have one. Um, I don't know who wins this, this nomination, but in terms of looking ahead, uh, right now I think a poll came out this morning or maybe yesterday from CNN that has um, a, a Secretary Clinton up 48 to 47 in Nevada. Uh, I think there was another poll that had them completely tied. So Nevada, which is on Saturday at the moment, for all intents and purposes, is a tie race. Um, the conventional wisdom holds that for Hillary's success, it's uh, South Carolina and Super Tuesday um, for two main reasons. One, the African-American share of the electorate in South Carolina and in the other Super Tuesday states is much uh, greater than it is or has been in uh, Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, to give you a sense, 
her favorability among African Americans, 73% favorable, 18% unfavorable. Um, uh, among, for, for Senator Sanders, 42% favorable, 35% unfavorable. If you look at the averages of polls right now, she is winning. Um, she has majority support across every state on Super Tuesday, with the exception of Vermont. Um, but things change, as you know. Uh, depending on what happens with Nevada, depending on what happens with South Carolina, momentum will drive the narrative as Super Tuesday approaches. Um, financially, they are competitive. In terms of the on-the-ground organizing, that, um, that will remain to be seen as they have, head into the Super Tuesday states. Um, I do not have a crystal ball as to what happens there, but uh, definitely stay tuned. Did you, am I finished here? I should not pass on to Bob. Okay, um, with that, I will pass it on to Bob Carpenter. Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to spend some time with you. Um, I'm going to get up and move around if that's okay with the cameraman. Okay. Um, I've got some slides I'd like to show you. Just some um, historical information about where seniors are in terms of the electorate. And you can see in um, 1976, which is as far back as I went, 14% were 60 plus. And it's gone to a high in uh, 1988 of 22%. Um, some of these numbers are 60 plus and some are 65 plus. In, in 76, 80, and 88, it was 60 plus. All others, it was 65 plus. But you can see it's leveled out over the last three elections at 16%. So those 65 plus are making up 16% of the electorate, which is a big share and will continue to grow as, as Americans continue to live longer, um, I would expect this would, would continue to, to increase. Um, so where have seniors been over the last um, several elections? In 1976, Carter was winning with 50% of the vote. Ford was losing with 48. But Ford carried seniors 52 to 48%. So seniors in that election trended slightly Republican. In 1980, Reagan was winning 51 to 41 over Carter with Anderson at 8% and getting 55% of the Republican vote. So the senior coalition continued, actually grew uh, on the Republican side. And then in 1984, when Reagan was winning 59 to 41, truly a landslide, if you will, um, he was getting 64% of the senior vote. So again, the, co the senior coalition remained on the Republican side with um, uh, Vice President Mondale at 36%. Tightened up in 1988 with um, George H.W. Bush at 51 to Dukakis's 49. Bush was winning 53 to 46 overall. So the senior coalition was beginning to, to shift a little bit and um, completely shifted in 1992 with 50% going for um, Governor Clinton and 39% um, going with President Bush. Um, Clinton was winning 43 to 37 with Perot, the wild card, at um, 19%. In 1996, Clinton uh, maintained the senior coalition 50 to 44. Um, and Gore held it in 2000 with 51 to 47, uh, with Buchanan at less than one and Nader at two. Coalition shifted back in 2004. Skip one. Um, no, sorry. Okay. Uh, with uh, George W. Bush at 52, John Kerry at 47, and then a couple others. So the coalition has has shifted back and forth. Um, in 2008, it remained on the Republican side, 53 to 45, um, with actually the, the numbers being exactly um, sh uh, shifted among all voters. But again, McCain was uh, at 53. Romney increased that to 56% uh, while losing to Obama, um, 51 to 47. Um, so, what happens next, it's hard, it's hard to say. But I, did, I wanted to put up the 2012 platform of the Republican National Committee, saving Medicare for future generations and security for those who need it, ensuring retirement security. So in a document that was um, 
okay? Uh, go ahead. About 60 pages long, 65 pages long, there was mention of both these with subsequent paragraphs following on, but I, I wanted to highlight these. The Republican Party is committed to saving Medicare and, and Medicaid, and while no changes should adversely affect any current or near retirees, comprehensive reform should address our society's remarkable medical advances and longevity and allow younger workers the option to create their own investment accounts as supplements to the system. The dreaded word reform, both sides, every candidate needs to be very, very careful how they use the word reform when it comes to Social Security and, and Medicare. Uh, Jonathan got into this um, a little bit on the uh, percentage of the senior vote in Iowa in the caucuses was 28 on the Democratic side, 27 on the Republican side. So a larger coalition than, than nationally. And how seniors voted in Iowa, um, Cruz was winning with 28% to Trump's 24 and Rubio 23. Same um, basic numbers among seniors, 27, 26, and 22. Um, in Iowa, or excuse me, in New Hampshire, slightly lower numbers, 18% Democrat, 19% Republican, still above the 14% that we saw in 2012 nationally. And how did that break down? Trump at 31, Kasich at 19, Bush at 15, Rubio at 11, and Cruz at nine. Um, not too different from the numbers among all voters. Um, so what happens next? South Carolina is, is next on the agenda, um, Nevada as well. Depending on which polls you believe, um, the senior coalition could be anywhere from 21% to 64%. Um, the South Carolina, South Carolina uh, Republican House Caucus has it at 64%. I think that's probably high. Um, CBS has it at 21%. That's probably um, low. It's probably somewhere between the 21 and the 32 of the Augusta Chronicle. Um, but again, you know, we pollsters pride ourselves on having good numbers, but, it, but this really shows that if you have a bad sample, you could have bad numbers. Um, so just briefly coming up next, South Carolina Republican primary on Saturday, the Nevada Republican caucus a couple days later, and then as Jonathan mentioned, Super Tuesday. Will it all be over by Super Tuesday? Very possibly. There's a lot going on on the 1st of March. And then we, we continue on to, um, through March, April, and, and May. But Super Tuesday is the, the day to watch, and the senior coalition could make the difference as, as, they, as I've shown they have made in, in both the, the two contests that have already been held and the, um, the over, over the last 30 or 40 years, their, their vote share. So with that, let me stop there, and uh, I think we both look forward to questions. I wanted Jonathan to, I don't think he had quite enough time to finish his presentation, so please go ahead. Uh, sure. So I can skip over um, some of the, the, the sense on the Republican side since, since Bob covered that and just talk a little bit about the issue environment among uh, seniors out there. So for the longest time, uh, I guess that's really hard to back up, but for a very long time, the economy has dominated, dominated the issue agenda across age cohorts, and that same has been true among uh, senior citizens. With the tax in Paris and San Bernardino, you saw a spike in terrorism as one of the top concerns among voters out there. That has receded amongst uh, all voters, but among seniors it is still as one of the top concerns. So for all voters, the economy is back to being the number one concern. But for seniors, in the most recent polling we've seen, it's terrorism and security as a, as a, as a uh, broadly defined issue is up there with economic concerns and also those um, for the older communities such as Social Security and Medicare as well. Another issue though that is emerging underneath the radar, and you hear this on both sides of the aisle in terms of, um, or both sides of, of the campaigns, is this, this notion of government reform. So you hear this from Cruz talking about uh, the Washington cartel, you hear this from Bernie talking about billionaires and their contributions. Um, we have seen for a while, uh, it's, and it started to bubble up in some in additional kind of Gallup tracking of, of what the most important issues are, 
Um, this traction behind the reform agenda and even some of these more process-oriented um, uh, issues like campaign contributions and redistricting, things that we never thought were, I mean, we always thought they were important, but never kind of top of mind, and they are starting to become a little bit more top of mind among the electorate, particular among seniors as well. Seniors are more tax sensitive than other voters um, for understandable reasons with the, 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 the sizable numbers who are uh, have um, uh, fixed incomes. So that can be something that is, can be leveraged in, um, in, the, in the general election in terms of proposals that might have impacts on taxes. Um, they are more likely to believe that wealth is the product of hard work than opportunity than our younger voters in the election. When it comes to social security, um, one of the things that we have found uh, in, in our polling on behalf of the National Committee and others is that uh, a lot of the standard proposals that are out there, raising the retirement age, uh, means testing benefits, etc., we find majorities across party lines actually oppose, and that holds true with seniors as well. The one that they favor is expanding benefits by raising the cap um, on wages. So 79% of all voters favor this, 82% of seniors. Um, favor this. But the, the main thing that why that isn't bubble up as to a top concern is that there isn't a perception right now that Social Security is under attack the way that some people did perceive that, um, for example, during the, the Super Committee back in 2011 or when uh, President, former President Bush was, um, was, was proposing to privatize Social Security, for example. And right now we actually find majorities believe that Social Security will be there for them when they retire. 54% majority believe that. When it comes to Medicare, the one proposal that we consistently see or have seen for a couple of years now, and particularly among seniors that we see support for, is allowing the government to negotiate for lower prescription drug prices. Um, when we talk about what the main problem is within, um, uh, behind prescription drugs, which are a particular concern for um, senior citizens, amongst all voters, 25% say insurance companies, 23% say the government, 15% say prescription drug companies. Among seniors though, prescription drug companies are right up there with um, insurance companies. So insurance companies 24%, government at 24%, and prescription drug companies at 22%. So for seniors, they see prescription drug companies more as a problem within uh, Medicare and within, um, and whose decisions impact their, their cost of living in their day to day and they see them much more as a problem than do voters overall. And we have seen it in our polling, as I mentioned, support for allowing um, uh, Medicare to negotiate the prescription drug prices. I do have other stuff I can talk about on, on the ACA, if, if that is of relevance or if you want to talk about. Sure. Um, so I spoke to, um, to Max and some organizations two weeks ago, and that morning there had been another vote um, uh, to repeal uh, the ACA. And one thing we saw in a, a recent polling was that when Kaiser tra has a tracking poll on this, when Republicans do this, are they being politically advantageous or do they think that it's bad for the country? And so I, as the Democrat of, of uh, the two pollsters over here, am okay with uh, Republicans continuing to try to vote for repeal. 60% of independents say that, it, that they, they view the repeal votes as being politically advantageous as opposed to um, uh, thinking their, their motivations are pure. Um, but when it comes to uh, perceptions of the ACA, seniors are actually a little bit more pessimistic than our voters overall. So there was a poll that was asked recently that had a variety of different options of what do you want to have happen to the ACA. The top two were make changes to improve it and repeal. Neither of those got um, a majority. Among all voters, 33% want to make changes to improve, 24% want to repeal. Among seniors though, 33% want to repeal, just 29% want to make changes to improve. So a lot of that though tracks to um, uh, perceptions on the president. Seniors have lower favorability ratings of the president than do voters overall. And perceptions of the ACA, uh, also known as Obamacare, have been largely wrapped up in perceptions of the president for some time. So the fact that Republican, uh, excuse me, seniors have um, a, uh, more negative views of the ACA does not surprise me, given they have more negative views of the president than do um, other voters. In terms of, uh, there is a, a narrative out there um, that the ACA is raising uh, uh, raising um, insurance premiums. 
Um, the Kaiser survey that I mentioned earlier found that among pre-seniors, so between 18 and 64, actually that is not pre-senior, that is kind of a senior. <laughs> Forgive me there. Uh, 68, in a way they are, yeah, I'm a pre-senior as well. 68% um, say their healthcare is excellent or a good value. Among those who are insured, 88% say they are satisfied with their insurance and 88% uh, did not change their doctor. Those same questions among Medicare recipients, so 65 plus, 90% are satisfied with their insurance. So seniors are wildly satisfied with Medicare, uh, but there's a perception that younger voters are not satisfied with the ACA. And while there are certainly anecdotes to that, um, the public opinion shows that there is satisfaction with their insurance uh, and folks have not had to change their doctor as, as, um, as others have posited. So, I'll pause there. Um, I don't know if you wanted to open it up for questions or if Bob, if you had more. Well, let me ask uh, Bob if he had any other comments to make. Particularly, I, I'd be interested, and I think many of us would, in uh, if the afford if you your your research shows the what the impact of the Affordable Care Act had on some of the congressional races since then, uh, as well as the presidential. Well, I, I, I don't have any exact numbers, but I, I will say that, and to, to Jonathan's point, voters are, are, and seniors are concerned about the economy. And a, a second tier for, for voters, a high second tier for seniors is terrorism and security. And that, that's terrorism and security in their homes, security in their country, security in their neighborhoods. The repealing the, the Affordable Care Act is not on anybody's radar screen, except about 240 people downtown. <laughs> um, and I say that as a Republican, but when, when the economy is anywhere from 25 to 35% in terms of the most important issue facing the country, repealing the Affordable Care Act is not doing anything to improve or fix the economy. And at, at some point, voters are going to get fed up with the, what are we, 75 or 80 attempts? Um, you know, let's move on. Let's talk about issues that are important to voters. And, you know, as I, as I showed, the senior coalition is an important coalition in any election. And they're concerned with health care, but they're not concerned with repealing um, Obamacare or, or the ACA. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the various candidates, um, or multitude of candidates on my side of the aisle, um, I, would, I would ask you all to go to their websites and look and see what they're saying about senior issues, what they're saying about um, the issues that are important to you. Because I looked around a little bit, and with the exception of one or two of the leading candidates, there isn't a senior tab, there isn't an older American tab. There's a lot of information on those websites, but when you're prepping for something like this, you know, you'd like to know where a particular candidate stands. Now, there's a lot of information about where the candidate stands from other organizations, but I'd kind of like to know from, from the candidate, him or herself. Um, so I think we need to do a better job of pressuring the candidates to speak out on the issues of importance. And if it's if it's between you know if it's 14 to, to 20 percent of the vote of the electorate, I think that they have an obligation to tell you where they stand. Um, as we move forward between now and and the close of the primary season, whether that's on Super Tuesday or at some later date. Um, the, the candidates need to tell you, and, and we've got um, a number of candidates who are um, need to be thinking about their retirement years because they're, some of them are nowhere near that. On my side, on the on the Democratic side, the, the candidates are are slightly older, um, but they need to be thinking about and talking about issues that are important to voters, and, and certainly Medicare and Social Security. Um, dare I say, reform or um, or maintenance um, are important, and they need to be talked about. I, I really I couldn't agree with you more on the last point, and I think many of the groups uh, here and watching uh, have uh, 
been encouraging their membership to go to town hall meetings in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, and onward, and ask those questions. Because I was very interested in uh, your comment that uh, these candidates avoid talking about reform. And when they do talk about reform, they don't explain what it means. So I would ask uh, anyone who's involved in, in this program, when you go to your town hall meetings, uh, and someone who's running for president talks about we need to reform Medicare or Social Security, what does that mean? Does reform mean raising the retirement age? Uh, does reform mean uh, reducing uh, benefits? Does reform mean bringing more revenue into the program? You know, we, we, and I'm not surprised there are very few TAPs uh, that explain this because and, uh, I haven't seen that either, which is one of the reasons we're, we're uh, having this Senior Society Forum. Now, uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to open it, I, I think, to a couple questions from uh, the audience. We did have one uh, from our online uh, uh, visitors, and and uh, I'd like to ask your comment on, uh, to comment on it. We, uh, you know, we know there are about 10,000 people every day turning 65 and being eligible for uh, Medicare and, and soon for for Social Security. Uh, but I'm curious, and and uh, someone forwarded this question: What are you detecting uh, that is driving? call it younger retirees, people 50, in their 50s. Uh, are there issues related to uh, the issues uh, concerning uh, seniors that are important to uh, people that are in their 50s? Either one. Well, as somebody who's in their late 50s, I'm, like many um, seniors and, and pre-seniors, scared to death that the, the program won't be there or, or won't be the same as as we as it currently is or as we expect um, <coughs> you know saving for retirement is one thing that many of us do horribly <coughs> and having the the safety net of social security um, is extremely beneficial so again as somebody late 50s approaching 60 um, the concern that it's going to be there and it's going to be in the same form that we've come to expect and that we've paid into for 30 or 40 years. And I would just add actually even prior to that question, which I think helps shed light on, on that question as well. Um, when we had looked at um, Congressman Ryan's budget and his proposed changes to Medicare, um, despite a lot of attempts at trying to say that it would not um, have any changes on current beneficiaries and soon-to-be beneficiaries, there was a, a, a lack of trust that that would be the case. And so there was a fear that um, changes to Medicare would increase costs, would make it harder to, to choose your own doctor, um, uh, would increase prescription drug costs and out-of-pocket um, costs as well. So there, were, there was anxiety that, um, that some of the potential reforms out there would make the current programs not as they have been um, for those. And when I say pre-retiree, uh, we look at between 50 and 64 typically is, is that definition. Also, with the stock market, um, I don't know, 10% down over the past month or two or something like that, uh, and plenty of volatility, between, and I, I am not an economist or a financial advisor, but you know, with China and with, um, I sound like Donald Trump when I say that, with China, <laughs> with, um, with uh, the oil prices going down and whatnot, that generates some of the additional economic concerns that we see. So the fact that, um, that the economy has returned uh, to the number one issue among voters under 65, it's even more important for those who are trying to save for retirement, uh, who see this volatility and the fact that there's not much they can do about it. If they have saved, They've tried and now things are happening and their nest egg is being threatened. So that those kind of concerns and, and the fact that they're running out of time to, to put money away, um, those kind of concerns contribute to the economic anxiety and contribute to a lack of trust when some of the reform proposals are put forward that they are going to change the programs in a fundamental way and not um, keep the promise that they have been um, when they've been working their lives prior to that. Uh, you know, when I, I have participated in uh, 
hundreds of town hall meetings uh, over the years and uh, often find uh, seniors about to be Medicare eligible are, are astounded to, to uh, learn that Medicare does not cover vision, does not cover hearing, does not cover dental. Uh, they just assumed that that was the case. And uh, a lot of the groups here are supportive of uh, legislation that would begin to add those benefits. Are you hearing any of that in any of your research? Uh, other other health care needs of uh, seniors? Um, I have not, no. I mean, we have done some work with um, those with chronic illnesses and their perceptions of the Affordable Care Act, for example, uh, and not to, to harp back on the ACA bandwagon, but there are many out there who feel very thankful that pills that used to cost them, um, or, or treatments that used to cost them $500 can now cost them five. Um, so there are those out there who have who are now have treatment have, that have that um, this is not these are not Medicare beneficiaries um, that are thankful for that. But I have not looked at specifically that um, with, with folks on Medicare or seniors. Um, I have not either. I have not seen any of that. I think that that one of the reasons that we have, as pollsters or we as focus group moderators may not have asked that question or asked that, that series of questions is that. There's, there's so much else. You know, when you're talking about it, expanding the cap or when you're talking about raising the, the minimum uh, age, or when you're talking about reform, there's so much in that bubble to talk about that you don't have necessarily have time to get into the expansion in terms of other health needs. Uh, I want to invite the audience, anyone in the audience uh, that has a question, and. I'll repeat it so we can make sure. Uh, I'll try to repeat it. Go ahead. Yes. I'm a former uh, federal employee. I was with the uh, Federal Employees Health Benefits Program for over uh, 40 years into my retirement. Started in 1973, and every year since 1973, my premiums have gone up. I think President Obama was 12 years old in 1973. My question is, how could a, a system that is designed to pool un uninsured people to get them a group rate, drive premiums up, as it is on the Affordable Care Act. Because that argument doesn't make any sense to me. And nobody ever explains to me how it drives it up. Because it's been going up as the same insurance companies, what before ACA and after ACA. So why, how, does it bl how do they blame Obamacare for the premiums going up? I think we've heard about it. Um, I, I, not being an economist, I have a hard time uh, answering that. I, I, am not, I do not pretend to be a policy wonk. Um, I do think, though, that the blame game as it's been played when it comes to ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, is inherently political. Um, and so to what extent is it rooted in reality? Um, that's a very fair question. Um, I think that, you know, from Senator McConnell saying that he was going to, I forget the colorful language that he used, but use the ACA to, to sink uh, the president to a one-term president. So I, I don't know the, the technical answer to your question, but I, I certainly know and I'm aware, of, as I'm sure others here are as well, that uh, the ACA has been very politicized since, um, since it was passed. Well, I, I'm not an economist either, so, and nor, nor a healthcare expert. Um, I can tell you, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, the ACA and Obamacare are blamed for everything. <laughs> the ACA is a little bit like being a locally elected official, as Max indicated I am. The weeds in your lawn are my fault. The weeds in your lawn are, are the ACA's fault. Um, it, it's, a, it's an easy punching bag. And um, so I think that's the reason that it's blamed for, for many things. Um, the ACA, in my experience, has benefited a lot of people. It, I'm not, I don't run into people that it's harmed. Um, it's actually benefited me as a, as a, you know, I, I own my own business. I'm a one-man band, and I would have trouble getting health care without the ACA. Back there, yeah. yes. Um, I'm curious as to um, whether, when you were asking the questions, you 
asked about um, entitlements as opposed to Social Security and Medicare. Because I see often candidates talking about being in favor of cutting entitlements, but not in favor of cutting Social Security and Medicare. And I wonder how much people understand that when they talk about cutting entitlements, they're talking about Social Security and Medicare. Yeah. Let me repeat that case so it doesn't go through. The question, I think, is uh, in, the, in the polling, do you make a distinction between uh, the terms of uh, Social Security, Medicare, and the broader term entitlements? Yeah. We did actually. We explicitly tested that. And I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. But uh, the good news is majorities of voters across party lines oppose cuts to either when you call it entitlements or when you call it Social Security and Medicare. Yeah. Support for those programs is stronger, though, uh, when you say Social Security and Medicare. So entitlement has been the, a, an attempt to try to undercut support by kind of creating those programs as a, as a handout um, entitled as opposed to deserved. Um, and so that's, that has been an intentional term of art for a number of years. And it does do the trick to a certain extent. It, it erodes support somewhat. But those programs are so strong. Any politician in America today would love to have the approval ratings of Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> um, and so when you call them Social Security and Medicare, they are much more popular than we call them entitlement programs. But still popular. Yes, please. Uh, can you say a little bit about how sensitive seniors are to prescription drug prices uh, being as high as they are, at least for specialty drugs? And, or are they more concerned about the donut hole? Can you, have you done any work in those areas? Um, the question was about sensitivity towards prescription drugs, and in particular, the donut hole. Um, and, and Bob and I have not done work specifically on that in, in recent times. But what, we, we, what I do see in the data that's, um, that's available out there, um, regardless of what we've asked, is that there is a, a greater sensitivity to those costs. Um, so that's when you get these anecdotes of seniors buying drugs from Canada, for example. Um, because when you're on a fixed income and the prices go up, what are you going to do? So I mean, it's, it, we, it came clear in the data when, when we were uh, preparing for this that it is uh, prescription drug companies are a larger, they are perceived to be a larger part of the problem among seniors than they are among other voters. Uh, and um, the cost of prescription drugs is of a greater concern for seniors on fixed incomes than it is for other voters as well. And I would just add that Issues like that, which are fairly fine-pointed, tend to, to rise in the numbers, as we see them, around an event. You know, the, the, the guy that bought the company, I don't, I don't remember his name, and raised the, the cost four or five hundred percent, and now is, you know, a guest at um, some state or federal institution. Um, <laughs> You, we would have seen an increase in numbers in terms of the, the concern or the unfavorableness around that. Part of the issue that we face is there's so much in the, the senior realm that when we do a survey for, for the National Coalition or we do a survey for AARP or one of the other organizations or do a survey in general, there's so much to cover that we often can't get as specific as we would like to. Yes, back there. Hi. Uh, Medicaid is also such an important part of the mix for older adults, and so many are unaware of the importance it plays in access to long-term services. I'm wondering if Medicaid even shows up as kind of registering in the older adulter kind of issue bit when you guys talk. Um, a little bit. It is the, the question was about Medicaid uh, and whether or not it comes up in um, uh, in the conversation with seniors and. It is popular. It is somewhat confused with, with Medicare among some folks. Mm -hmm. um, but the Kaiser survey that I've, I've mentioned to you a couple times, when they were asking about what are the most important issues, 64% said the cost of health care, uh, Medicare 61%, Medicaid 55%. So that's still important. And these weren't asked pinned against each other. You got to pick one. Um, so 55% of people saying that Medicaid is important is still much, much. That's a very strong number, but relative to Medicare, relative to the cost of health care, and that I think my, my gut tells me that that's a little bit 
just based on a uh, low information about the program relative to Medicare, which more people are familiar with. I, I would just add that Medicare and Medicaid <coughs> are are important as evidenced by the the uh, paragraphs of the Republican the 2012 Republican platform. The the opening sentence: the Republican Party is committed to saving Medicare and Medicaid. So it's on. Maybe not an even par, but it's certainly up there in terms of importance, I think, to both parties. We'll take a couple more back in the way back. It seems that the uh, long term care and caregiving are the real calamity facing most of the people and their families, but it never shows up. Uh, is there any evidence that there's a latent issue there and a framing that would bring it out of the good work? We always talk about Medicare, but it's really the ones in the care costs that are mailing money. Sure. Um, so some data that I've seen, and it is, it is, uh, it is admittedly dated, um, but long-term care is certainly important. Um, perceptions of it vary, though, based on the type of care. So nursing care, nursing home care is, is the least uh, favored compared to home care uh, or group home care, for example. So. I mean, people, what people, their concerns about that are to ensure that the caregiver has been vetted, that they've uh, uh, gone through a background check, uh, that they have proper training and proper qualifications. So it is, when we ask about it, it becomes a concern. It's something that does register. Uh, the preferred mode would be home health care followed by group home care, um, with nursing care being seen. There are, there are some negatives around nursing home care in the last time that I've seen data on it. That's a great question that unfortunately I don't I don't feel um, knowledgeable enough to answer on in, in that in that level. The level is about the, the question's about um, do people know about the cost of long term care and, and, and um, to what level does to what extent does that generate concern? Um, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't I don't have any data to to back up what what you're asking or what you're suggesting. I think it's, it's a matter of when you face it, it's a concern. At the same as, as when, you are, when you have Medicare and you go to get a hearing aid, or you go to get glasses, or you go to get your teeth fixed or clean. Um, then it becomes a concern. Then it becomes knowledgeable. But at this point in time, I'm not sure that the average American um, it knows enough about what Medicare covers and doesn't, and and the other issues that face senior Americans. When when they, they slap you in the face, you recognize it. But when you're 23 and and um, you know living life, it, it's not something that you you live or, or that you're concerned about because unless you've got senior parents or, or grandparents that you're experiencing that. It's but again. To, to the point I made earlier, there's so much in the senior realm that you know we, we could do a two-hour survey um, to and and not even brush the surface of issues that older Americans are facing every day. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your presentations. Uh, you're a great team. Uh, we've <laughs> used both of you, and you're a great team. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, be, before we go, to, thank you, guys. Before we go to the uh, campaigns, I just wanted uh, Susan Donnelly to come up for a second, and uh, she's she's the managing director of uh, of Next Avenue. That's our media partner, and uh, I wanted her to uh, make a few comments uh, about the organization. Many of you have probably been involved with it. Thank you so much. I'm actually excited because I do have something to say about long-term care, so so that's good. Um, oh, I think that's good. so. Thank you so much um, for 
for letting me be here today. Um, I'm really excited. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a survey that we recently fielded at Next Avenue um, asking our readers what matters to them in the election. Um, I should first say, for those of you who don't know yet, Next Avenue is um, the first and only public media website um, designed to serve the needs of older Americans. Um, so every day we're part of the PBS family and every day we're publishing articles and resources and surveys um, to help our readers navigate their path um, as they age. So we've got millions of folks who are part of America's booming age, uh, the booming older population who are our, part of our readership. And so, you know, we're really thinking about them on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the issues that matter to them, the issues that we're talking about um, matter to them every day. They're not academic for them, um, and they're not part of a vague future. They matter right now, and they're going to matter throughout the next administration uh, and beyond. So that's why we, we took the time with the, um, with the financial support of the SCAN Foundation to survey our readers, and I'm just going to talk a tiny bit um, about what we heard from our 3,400 respondents. So first of all, um, it won't be a surprise, 98% of respondents are planning to vote. So they're seniors and they're engaged. I should also say that um, Next Avenue readership is slightly younger um, than the definition of senior we've been using today. They're 54, 65 primarily. We also have some older folks. We also have some younger folks. Um, but so when we asked them if aging issues would be a factor in their voting decisions, um, they unanimously said that it would. Not unanimous, 67% said that aging issues would be a factor. And 73% told us that they don't think presidential candidates are uh, paying enough attention to the issues that matter to older Americans. And that is why Next Avenue is a media partner for this event. Our readers want to know where the candidates stand. We talked about that a little bit before, and it's events like these that um, that are part of making that happen. So we're really excited to be able to share with our readers what we learned today. Um, so in addition to sort of knowing generally that aging issues matter, we drilled down a little bit deeper and talked some about a few specific issues. And what we heard across the board is something that I think um, echoes what we just talked about, which is two issues really rose to the top for our readers. Um, those being health care and financial security. They told us this in several different ways. They were asked to rank issues in terms of what matters most, um, and also in significantly in narrative comments. They told us really time and time again that they're concerned about their personal um, economy and the security of their quality of life. So one example that I think uh, reinforces what we were talking about earlier regarding drug costs, 94% uh, of respondents said that they support government finding ways to manage or reduce drug costs. So that's right there at the nexus of health care and, and personal finances. Um, and that thing continued. We think a lot and write a lot about long-term care at Next Avenue. For about a year and a half now, we've been publishing an ongoing special report about long-term care issues. So Next Avenue readers are pretty well informed um, about, about these issues, and they do recognize long-term care costs as a significant risk um, to their personal finances. We did a, a related survey uh, in October, and about 6,000 respondents told us that uh, a quarter of them were or only a quarter of them were confident about their ability to pay for their long-term care needs, and majority supported policy options to help Americans finance long-term care. So on this survey, we drilled down a bit more, and we found that the majority of respondents um, supported expanding Medicaid to cover long-term care costs, um, and they also wanted uh, policies to incentivize personal savings um, for long-term care costs. So um, again, the variety of issues we asked them about, health care and financial security really rose to the top. And the last thing I'll say um, about what we learned from our readers, and I think it may be um, the most powerful thing we heard, is that 
they don't want to be thought of as a single-minded, um, self-interested voting bloc. They told us time and time again when we asked them to back out and think about other issues outside of aging related issues that matter to them as they'll be making their voting um, decisions this fall. And aging uh, related issues came in fifth. It was behind um, the economy, healthcare, climate change, foreign policy. In narrative comments, they told us other um, issues that they felt like were more critical. So they do care about aging issues, but not exclusively. And the reason why they told us is because they really care deeply about the future and future generations. Their kids, their grandkids, um, they're scared for their futures and they care about those issues as well. And they don't want to be perceived as just a drain on, their con on our country's resources. They think they can be part of the solution. Um, they, they say that they think we're in this all together and one reader um, said, you can't separate life into neat little packages based on age or any other demographic. And I think as we move into this next part of the forum, it's a great reminder to all of us that there is no single voice of older Americans. Um, their perspectives are diverse and, um, and varied and I think worthy of consideration uh, with all of that complexity. So um, in the room there are handouts with a sort of snapshot of some of our um, findings. For folks on the live stream, you can go to nextavenue.org. There's tons of information there. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're, we're going to move on to the uh, candidates portion of, uh, of the program. Uh, Hello, Congressman. Uh, we, uh, when we started working on this, uh, we sent a letter of invitation on uh, November 24th uh, to everybody that was running for president. There were a few more running than there are today, but everybody got a letter. And uh, we followed up since that time, it's been about three and a half months, with many, many phone calls, emails, uh, try to contact campaigns. Uh, Governor Kasich and Senator Sanders, uh, recognizing the importance of the issues uh, impacting seniors, accepted our invitation. Now, all of the other campaigns declined to participate, and I was going to say that that speaks for itself, but since it speaks for itself, I, I guess I don't have to say that, right? <laughs> anyway, um, Governor Kasich of Ohio, uh, Republican candidate for president is represented uh, today by former Congressman Tom Davis. We're honored to have you here, Congressman. Uh, Congressman Davis served seven terms in the House of Representatives, representing the 11th District of Virginia, just uh, not too far from here. And uh, before that was a member of the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, he served in the House with Governor Kasich, who chaired the House Budget Committee, I believe, at the time uh, you served with him. Uh, uh, Congressman Davis chairs the governor's uh, campaign here in Virginia, and we're honored uh, to have you with us. And, and also, I understand you have a special relationship with George Mason University. Uh, you're the chair of the Board of Visitors, so thank you for having us visit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I also teach a political science class, uh, I, now that I'm chairman of the board for free. Um, but uh, and the most important part of my resume, though, is that I left Congress undefeated and unindicted. And I'm very, very proud of that. So I'm a senior. I'm 67 years old now. But I remember when I came to Congress, I, look, I, I was chairman of the House Republican Campaign Committee two cycles, chairman of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. And I will tell you, the way politics is, and it, you always say this when you leave and look for the good old days. I'm not sure they were good. But it's gotten so polarized today, it's been hard for me to really get enthusiastic about anybody. I'm enthusiastic about John Kasich. When I first came to Congress uh, in 1994, I remember a lot of my advisors saying, stay away from this guy, he's hard right, he's, you know, he's pushing the envelope, and he did, because he saw what unbalanced budgets were doing to this country. 
the, the rising deficits at that point, uh, we're, we're putting in jeopardy our long-term programs, the safety of Social Security, the safety of Medicare, uh, but more importantly, the burden it was going to leave on our children and our inability to do other things in government as we started paying more and more in interest on the national debt. And as chairman of the Budget Committee, John pushed the envelope, but you know what? We reached a deal with the Clinton administration in 1997, and we had four years of balanced budgets. And when, we left, when he left Washington and left Congress, again, he left undefeated and unindicted too, uh, uh, to, to leave for the private sector, uh, he left us with uh, projected budgets as far as the eye could see, and the new Congress and new president came in and just uh, they, it, it kicked it away between wars, between tax cuts and all these other things as it added up and, and continued government spending, it went away. And now we're at the point where we can't do a lot of things we'd like to do. By 2020, uh, or 2022, the Congressional Budget Office says we will be paying over a trillion dollars a year out of current revenues just for interest on the national debt. What does that do to our kids? The first trillion dollars of taxes coming in goes to pay for the party that's gone on in the last 30 years. It's not fair, it's almost immoral. And somebody has to come in and try to straighten this out. Well, with John, John Kasich has made this a, a part of, who, of the very fiber of who he is. Uh, so he was out in the private sector for a number of years. He came back, was elected uh, governor of Ohio six years ago. Uh, took on a, a Democratic incumbent and defeated him and was re-elected, the voters of Ohio re-elected him by 30 percentage points four years later. Uh, but what did he do? When he came into Ohio, uh, it was an $8 billion deficit. They weren't sure they could even make a payroll at the end of the month. The, the economy was down, uh, revenues were down, uh, they had commitments that the, the state just couldn't make. John Kasich made some tough decisions in his first year in office and his numbers plummeted. But as I said, uh, four years later he was reelected by 30 points, which tells you something about he used the capital he had from his victory to make the tough decisions that had to be made. And the end result is that eight, that $8 billion deficit has turned into a $2 billion surplus today. Uh, they have added to the rainy day fund. Uh, they've added 400,000 net jobs at a time when Ohio was losing jobs before we came. He's put the welcome mat out for, to business. And whatever you think of business, you can't fund important programs without a tax base. And he recognizes that one of the major jobs of a corporation or a president is to attract capital, to attract business there so they provide the jobs and provide the tax base so that we can do the other things that are important to seniors, to young people, and the like. The problem with a lot of these uh, presidential plans right now is their numbers just don't add up. When you look, take a look at them, you look at it independently how they uh, get scored, their numbers are way off. They sound great. We're going to give you a free education, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that. But you have to pay for these things in the end. And as the old Fran oil filter guy says, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And when we pay you later, we don't make these decisions today. Really, the odds down the road, uh, the options get smaller and smaller and more severe. Uh, and it particularly hurts people who are on fixed incomes. It particularly hurts students who are trying to get a, a start in life. And uh, John Kasich understands this, but he doesn't just talk about it. Uh, he, has, he has done this. Uh, today, as I said, a $19 trillion deficit projected to go by 2022 to over a trillion dollars, which will be 40 percent uh, of the budget will be lifted up on interest on that debt. That's not just because of the rising debt. It's the fact that interest rates are so artificially low today. The problem is masked, and we don't expect them, at least the Congressional Budget Office, doesn't expect them to stay there forever. Uh, John was on the Armed Services Committee for 18 years. Uh, he is a defense hawk, but he also recognizes that the Defense Department has a lot of money that they're spending maybe in inappropriate ways. So he led the fight in Congress against the B-2 bomber when they were trying to get that funded and scrapped uh, most of the funding of, of that, saying we didn't need it at the time, that we could use our money in other ways. So he's, he's not afraid to stand up to uh, in special interest when it makes sense. But if you don't balance your books Fiscally, nothing else works. John Kasich hasn't just talked about it, he's done it. He's done it across party lines. And if you listen to his uh, uh, rhetoric today, uh, you know, he's his own man. Uh, you take a look at the Medicaid funding in Ohio. He, he took the Medicaid funding and he's under assault from every other um, Republican running against him for taking money because it was, quote, part of Obamacare. Frankly, he made it Ohio Care, his own program, he used it to help premiums for people who couldn't afford it otherwise, and he opened up a lot of nursing home beds for people who otherwise wouldn't have qualified, rather than just saying, we don't want to take that money because we don't like the source it came from. Uh, I think he's got the, not just the courage of his convictions, uh, he's been butting up against the establishment all his life, but he's made things happen. One of the few people I can be enthusiastic about, and 
You can't see him here today, but if you're Monday, he'll be at George Mason campus in Fairfax at uh, 10 o'clock, and uh, you're welcome to come out there. He's going to be doing a town meeting there, and I think I'll, I'll stop right there and open up for questions, Max. Great. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the audience to uh, pose some questions, but I was very uh, interested in your comment about Governor Kasich's uh, uh, approval uh, of Medicaid expansion because he's taken a tremendous amount of flack on the campaign trail for that. And um, I think he makes uh, one of the most compelling cases I've heard for why that was a good, good thing to do for Ohio. And I think, I think it'd be a good thing to do in a lot of other states as well. But I wonder, uh, can you uh, say anything about whether uh, the governor would be uh, amenable to changes in uh, the Medicare program, not Medicaid, but in the Medicare program that would uh, allow some uh, some support for long-term care services and, and long-term care supports that that issue came up uh, with the well if you look at what he did in ohio is he he, he put part of that money toward long-term care toward not necessarily having to put people in hospitals and warehouses but to let them have home care which in many cases is cheaper and they were able to do that with the additional money there so I, I think you have to look at the total situation. I don't want to put words in, in the governor's mouth, but I know they were able to care for more people in their home. They put more into long-term care as a result of that, one of the ways that they utilize that Medicaid money uh, in Ohio. But let's face it, Medicare is going to have to be changed. It, it is not sustainable growing at 7% a year. And people who look at you in the eye and say, we're going to put more into it, uh, they, they won't tell you where they're going to make the cuts because there isn't anywhere at this point. Uh, we're going to have to make some tough changes. The one thing he said is the people who are currently receiving it are going to continue uh, to receive it. We're going to try to do this in a common sense way that makes, that, that, uh, that makes sense. And if you want to know what a person is going to do, look what they've done. And I just invite you to look at his record in Ohio, look at his record, not just for seniors there, uh, but for all groups. He was a Republican who got 25% uh, of the African-American vote, which is pretty high for a Republican these days. Uh, he got a, uh, the, a, a, a huge minority vote out of other uh, groups uh, within the state. He's a very, very inclusive uh, a governor. He recognized that America uh, is a very diverse country. We need to respect, I think, that people from different backgrounds and different views and bring them in to the equation of solving problems and not just having them solve on one side of the table. Because you don't get your best outcomes when you only have one side at the table. Everybody needs to be a part of this. And I think that's been his decision-making process from the time he worked with Democrats to balance the budget to his time as governor of Ohio. Thank you very much. Uh, one other uh, question I wanted to ask you is, uh, and this is an issue that I think is uh, especially uh, relevant to Republican candidates. It involves uh, cutting taxes. And as you know, uh, there's a tax on Social Security benefits uh, uh, for individuals making above 25,000 a year. That threshold has been the same for over 30 years. And there are some talk that we've heard here in, in, in Washington of uh, adjusting that threshold because more and more people are being brought into it, and I think uh, not necessarily intentionally, but uh, lifting that uh, threshold would in fact be a cut for taxes for some seniors uh, receiving Social Security. And I wonder if you have any any insight on the governor's uh, well, I, 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 I've not talked to him about this, so I don't want to misrepresent it, but I would say that initially, when they started taxing this, he opposed it. If you remember back to his record in Congress in the Balanced Budget Act of, of 93, which taxed these, uh, he opposed it at that point. Uh, look, there are, well, seniors are not, as you've learned from the polling, not a monolithic group, but there are a lot of people who live on fixed incomes, and when you retire, we're living a lot longer than we used to, hopefully, uh, at least in my case. <laughs> And, and, yeah, and, and uh, as a result of that, you know, with COLAs have been held down and everything else, he, he, you know, I think he recognizes uh, the burden that that puts on a lot of, uh, of, on a lot of seniors of just being able to survive. Uh, so I'm, I don't know, I haven't talked to him about it, and I don't want to misrepresent where he would be on that, except that when they initially uh, taxed these back in the 93 Act, he opposed it. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, any, any, we'll have to take a couple questions uh, for uh, Congressman Davis. Well, let's get a couple zingers out there. I yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> you'll hear. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the defunding of Planned Parenthood, what basis did, uh, what basis did make this decision to be in favor 
I think he made it. The, the legislature voted it and put it on his desk. And at this point, I think he he is pro-life. Uh, and I think for the, for that reason, he he signed the bill at this point. I think if if, if they had decoupled it, uh, that it might, might have been a different. But he he signed the bill. Yes. Well, Medicaid is also an important component of that if you go into well, nursing. Yes, but you don't want to be that poor. You know, that's, that's down to nothing. So well, that's right. But, but when you cut that funding, you're even below nothing, is what would be the better way to put it. And I think one, the only Republican candidate who took the, the Medicaid money and recognized what this could do uh, for people, uh, in like the, for, for people you know, who met that need level. In addition to that, uh, I just note that um, you take a look. At, I, I don't have the specifics on what he did in Ohio with their, with their health care plan, but there's a recognition being able to keep people and having home visits sometimes being preferable to having to move people in, into, into institutions. Uh, these are tough issues. I know he favors more money on Alzheimer's, that we have not made the investment in this that we have in some other diseases. And long term, that's one of the fastest growing costs that we have in the system. Uh, caregiving is part of that, but more importantly, I think science holds the key in some of these areas to being able to break those locks and, and make it easier. Yeah, you know, I, I we told him that it probably just doesn't play that well in a Republican primary, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. As a former elected official back in Texas, I appreciate anyone that steps forward for the run for any office. But my question is, you mentioned that he's interested in cutting Medicare in areas. What what is his plan in cutting that? Because as seniors. We paid our price, and we hate to see some deep cuts, as I would think the GOP is willing to do. Well, and that uh, privatizing uh, Social Security, which I'm totally against. Well, first of all, the cuts are increases, and I don't know what you do. You're going to have to revamp Medicare. You can't sustain a program at seven percent. In Medicare Part B, frankly, people didn't pay in ahead of time. Medicare Part A, we paid into Medicare uh, Part B, uh, uh, not so much. Uh, I don't know what the specifics are in terms of what he's going to try to do. Uh, I know they favored um, uh, Medicare Advantage has been something that they've championed. It, it has had success in some areas. It's, I guess, a, a level of controversy. Uh, but I think, you know, I don't, I don't have any more specifics on that and the talking points on this to say, except to say, to look you in the eye and to just be able to say we're going to be able to continue and sustain this funding, uh, put so much, there won't be any other programs left. And so we're going to have to take a look at that. The good news is Social Security is easily fixable uh, if we act now. But the later uh, that we act on that, I think the more difficult that gets. Any other questions? Yes. Hi there. Uh, Congressman, what do you, uh, maybe you're not able to speak for the governor, but do you know the uh, governor's position regarding private investment of Social Security funds? I don't think, uh, I've never heard him speak in favor of that. I will just say when I was in the House, uh, I didn't think it was a very good idea. And you take a look at where the markets have gone, uh, it doesn't look like a very good idea today. Gotcha. Um, the, the reality is I think we don't get the return on the Social Security we'd like to get. But if you were to make that transition, I always put it this way. Um, the, the Social Security I will get, and I've opted to take it when I'm 70 and not now, uh, uh, my kids are paying for it. What my mother got, I paid for it. Uh, and, and what uh, her mother got it, it was paid by her generation just because government has borrowed so much of this through the years. Uh, something that uh, Governor Kasich opposed when he was in the House. He thought there should be a lockbox. This was basically sacred money that people were putting in today and we shouldn't be spending uh, on other things. Uh, administrations and Congresses uh, elected to do uh, otherwise. 
Um, so I guess to get to your question, uh, we recognize that there are going to have to be changes uh, to the system, but unlocking Social Security is relatively easy in terms of what the options are, and the faster we act, I think, uh, the, the better options we're going to have. If, if that's not, I'll be happy to respond if you want further response on that. Yes. yes. Given the case, it seems to offer a little different tone than his competitors, sort of a kinder, gentler tone. How in heaven's name does he expect to garner votes if he doesn't start calling people names? <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Uh, that, that's who he is, and I think he's at peace with himself, that you, you run with who you are, not who people want you to be, or, or to try to take down the other guy. If you look at his gubernatorial races and everything else, I think he's got a, there's a big spiritual part to the governor for those of us who know him. And that's just comfortable with who he's being, and this is a rough and tumble world, and it's, it, I guess it's tough to be that way. But let me just say this at the end of the day, you don't reach agreements with the other side when you're sitting there undercutting them and calling them names. There has to be a respect for other people. Nobody has all the solutions. And in the diversity we have in this country and the different lenses with which different groups view the world, uh, we need a government that's going to be inclusive, that's going to tackle the tough problems instead of kicking them down the road. We have kicked these problems down the road for so long though they get tougher and tougher and tougher on energy, on the environment, uh, on, on, uh, certainly on the, on the budget issues. Uh, nobody wants to make a tough decision. He has tackled these decisions head on, whatever he's been given the keys, but he's done it in an inclusive way because that's the only way you get the good answer. When you do it with one side and you exclude the other side, you get what you have with Obamacare today, where one side stuffs it down the other, and the other feels, well, we have to change it and get back. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way in Washington. I think that's, that's, that's who he is and it's who he's going to continue to be, win or lose. So we'll, we'll see what voters say over the long term. Uh, but I hope you'll consider him uh, on March 1st here in Virginia and in what other states are watching uh, as he runs it. You can make a great statement about positive politics uh, with a vote for Governor Kasich and maybe change the culture of the, the political climate the way it is today. Thank now, you. Can I ask you one final question, Congressman? Uh, you brought up the issue of the COLA. We were talking about the tax on Social Security. As, as you know, there's, there's no COLA uh, this year, 2016. There was zero COLA. Uh, 2010, zero cola in 2011. And I think a diet cola the year before that. <laughs> yes, a very, yeah, the cola wars. That's what we're talking about. But uh, uh, the, the formula that is used to determine what the cola is, uh, many of us believe is, is weight, it's not weighted properly. On the, if the point of a cola is for the Social Security check to keep up with inflation, it should, the formula should take into account the kinds of things seniors rely on, goods and services that they rely on, not so much a wage earner like gasoline, which has a, had a great impact on, on inflation, not helping seniors that much who aren't driving to work and back every day. So my, my question, and, and it, it, I, I will bet that at the town hall meetings the governor has, if he asks a group of seniors, how many of you believe that uh, the cost of living has not gone up for you in the last year. They'll laugh because they know that's not true. So do you think the governor, and, and, and perhaps you could encourage him to look, at least be open to uh, uh, examining a, an alternative formula that would be used to determine what the COLA is that looks at those uh, items that seniors rely on if that's the purpose of the COLA? Yeah, I'm speaking for myself here. I mean, I think that's fine if you come out to town meeting at uh, George Mason on Monday, feel free to ask him. I mean, I, these meetings are not staged. We let anybody in, and, and as long as they're not disruptive, they can ask any question, uh, question they want. And that's been, he did over 100 of these meetings in New Hampshire, and he answered any question that came his way. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, feel free to do that. But I want to make one point. If you don't have a strong tax base, nothing else works. And when you start running against business, and you start putting in taxes and regulations on business, business goes somewhere else. It's a global economy today. I found this thing when I ran the county government in Fairfax. As you remember, I won a contentious race in 1991 for chairman of the board uh, when the county was in dire financial uh, straits. And the one thing I learned is if you don't attract capital and investment in your area, you can't fund programs for seniors, you can't fund your programs for the poor, you can't fund education. It's nice to beat up somebody else and say they're not paying enough, but today, money goes somewhere else. Governor Kasich's been in the private sector. He understands this. 
Uh, he recognizes this is a dialogue that everybody needs to be included. And I will tell you this, Max, when it comes to COLAs for Seniors, his door is going to be open. It will be an inclusive table. It won't be a handful of Republican leaders sitting in a room deciding how to divide up the pie. You'll have seniors, you'll have Democrats, you'll have leaders from both parties. It's the way he's done it in Ohio. It's the way he was able to work with President Clinton uh, to pass a balanced budget act. And if that's the kind of leadership uh, you want, uh, I think uh, that's the kind you'll get with Governor Kasich. So once again, I hope you'll give him your support on March 1st. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Now, I think, we, I think we're going to take a, a couple minute, five minute break. No? We're going to go right ahead. We're not going to break. We're trying to get, we're going to get Senator Sanders on, uh, on this and I've got to go over here to make it work. Hello, hello? Testing, testing? Talk to me. Hello? Hello? Uh, yep, I can hear you. Um, can you just give me a 10 count? Okay, sounds good. Just uh, please speak up a little bit when you are asking the questions. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're good. It's it's clear and it's loud, but okay. I just, you That's know. That's the loudest it goes. I just want to make sure he's comfortable with the actual level. Yeah. Okay. So the mic's off? All right. Hold on for just a couple of minutes. Uh, Senator Sanders is getting in place. I don't know if you're as amazed as I am that this actually works, but uh, I'm hoping it does. <laughs>
Senator Sanders. Yep. Hold on a second. Testing, 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 one, two, three. We hear you testing. All right. We hear you testing. Senator, uh, it's Max Richmond. Uh, we're so honored that you would take time from what I know is an amazing schedule to appear before the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a very, very brief introduction because we want to hear from you. Uh, Senator Sanders, as we all know, has had a long distinguished public record of service as a U.S. Senator, a U.S. Representative, Mayor of Burlington. In the, Senator, in the Senate, Senator Sanders has worked tirelessly on health, education, and labor pensions committee, and serves as the ranking member of the budget committee. And as, you, as we all know, you chaired the Veterans Affairs Committee and really championed the fight against uh, the chain CPI. Not that many people know what that is, but if it had become a law, it would have hurt a lot of seniors, a lot of veterans, and we're so grateful for your leadership uh, on that issue. And we thank you for being uh, with us today. Senator, This uh, we have 202 watch parties that are looking at you right now in 141 cities <laughs> and all 50 states. So I'll turn it over to you now, Senator. Well, Max, uh, thank you very much uh, for moderating uh, this important event. And, and let me thank all of the organizations and the people who are participating in, in it. Uh, one of the disappointments, frankly, uh, that I've had in this campaign is for whatever reason, and I, I just don't understand it, uh, issues pertaining to seniors, issues pertaining to disabled media attention uh, that they should. Don't know why that's so. So I'm really glad that we're going to have this discussion uh, today. Um, there is no question, but we have a major, major crisis in this country in terms of the needs of seniors, disabled, veterans, veterans in general. Uh, and the facts are that for older workers, quite incredibly, and part of the disappearance of the American middle class, what we're seeing is that over half of older workers, 55 or older, they have zero savings for their retirement. Zero savings for their retirement. Which tells me that we have got to be very aggressive, not only in continuing the effort to stop Republicans from wanting to cut Social Security, but in fact, what we have to be talking about is expanding Social Security benefits. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I was chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, and in that capacity, working with veterans organizations and senior organizations, we came together to say, no, we're not going to have a chain CPI which is the most absurd idea that I've ever heard of, based on the concept, if you can believe it, that the COLAs, cost of living adjustments, that seniors are getting are too generous. And whenever I say this in a public meeting, people burst out laughing. And they say, how could it be too generous when we're getting zero increases? So our job right now is to continue the fight against cuts coming from Wall Street, coming from Republicans and a few Democrats, and say, wait a minute, when you have millions of seniors and disabled vets 
trying to survive on 11, 12, 13 thousand dollars a year social security we're not going to talk about cuts we're going to expand benefits because the truth is you can't make it on 12 or 13 thousand dollars a year so i am proud to have formed a, a caucus in the senate defending social security caucus which has been in the forefront in the struggle against cuts and now moving toward expansion now uh in terms of social security uh, as Max, as you know, we have introduced legislation, which is pretty simple. It is legislation that is supported by many senior organizations, which says that if we lift the cap on taxable income, which is now at 118,000, and you move it up to 250,000, and you say anybody above 250,000 or more is going to have to say the same, pay the same percentage of their income in Social Security taxes as people making 50000 a year. So if you lift that cap, what you can accomplish is a number of things. Number one, you can extend the life of Social Security, which is now 19 years, full benefits, to 58 years, 58 years. Number two, you can expand benefits by $1,300 a year for folks who are trying to get by on $16,000 a year or less. So we expand benefits, especially for lower income seniors, extend the life of Social Security for 58 years. What our legislation also does is something that I've been working on for a very long time, going back to when I was in the House, is say that the way we determine COLAs uh, for Social Security is really unfair. Uh, we have one breadbasket which applies to 18-year-old kids as well as 90-year-olds in terms of their purchasing practices. And that's crazy because older people disproportionately uh, spend money on health care, uh, prescription drugs, basic needs. You know, 20-year-olds are out buying uh, 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 electronics, they're out buying flat screen TVs. Those prices actually have gone down. Prescription drug costs have gone way, way up. So what we need is a segregated index to determine what seniors are spending. And when you do that, my strong guess is that there will be higher colors for seniors, which is, in fact, what is right and what they need. Uh, when we talk about Medicare, uh, you're looking at somebody who has vigorously opposed a Republican efforts to voucherize, privatize uh, Medicare. The idea uh, that we would give a senior a check for eight or nine thousand dollars a year and then say okay you got cancer you got heart disease you're 90 years of age you can use that nine thousand dollar check to go out to the private insurance market and get what you can well when you're 90 years of age and you're dealing with heart disease you're not going to get very much everybody knows that it is a disastrous idea in fact my view is not only should we not privatize social security but what we should be doing, privatizing Medicare or Social Security, but we should be doing with Medicare is expanding it and allow the United States to join the rest of the industrialized world and provide Medicare for all a single payer system. So we need improvements in Medicare, no question about it. We need to expand benefits in Medicare. Uh, and in my view, we should have a Medicare program for all health care for every man, woman, and child in this country as a right, not a privilege. Third issue that I have been working on really hard for a very, very long time, and that is the incredible uh, ripoff uh, of the American people by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this, to me, is, goes beyond politics. It goes beyond health care. It is a moral issue. Uh, right now in America, our people are paying by far uh, the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Uh, way back in the 1990s, late 1990s, some of you may recall, I took a busload of Vermonters, in, in, folks from northern Vermont, mostly women who are dealing with breast cancer. I took them across the Canadian border to Montreal. And the purpose of that trip was to demonstrate to the entire world, and it got a lot of attention, the absurdity of drug pricing in America, because these women were able to buy the exact same medicine 
not generics, the exact same brand name medicine that they were buying in Vermont in the USA for one-tenth of the price in Montreal, 10% of the price. Now, that may have changed over the years, but the truth remains that we pay much, much more than do the people of any other country for prescription drugs. Truth is that today, seniors are cutting their pills in half. Truth is that one out of five Americans who receive prescriptions from, from their doctors are unable to fill those prescriptions. Truth is that in the last year, the top three drug companies made $45 billion in profit. And because of the way, the power of the drug industry, the pharmaceutical industry, they can do anything they want. They can double the price of your medicine, triple the price tomorrow, nothing anybody can do about it. We have legislation in, trust me, that would do a lot about it. Uh, we would have uh, Medicare negotiating prices uh, with the pharmaceutical industry the way the VA does right now. Uh, we would allow uh, prescription drug distributors and pharmacists to be able to purchase brand name products, uh, pharmaceutical products from Canada, and I believe elsewhere going through safety uh, protocol, uh, so it, which would force prices in this country down to the level of other countries. So those are some of the issues, uh, Max, that, that we have been focusing on, uh, and I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, with uh, the people who are here today. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, uh, I had just a couple of questions that came from uh, our online uh, community. Uh, I've heard you talk a lot about uh, Medicare for all. And I'm wondering what you, if you would consider in your expansion of Medicare for all, adding uh, coverage, as great a program as Medicare is, as you know, it does not cover vision, dental, uh, hearing, things that are pretty important to the health and safety of, of yes. seniors. And what is yes. your view on that? I agree with that. I mean, we are talking about, when I talk about Medicare for all, what I am talking about is providing comprehensive health care coverage for all Americans. Uh, last that I heard, uh, hearing issues is part of uh, what health care is about. Uh, as you also know, I have been very uh, cognizant and have been in a leadership position uh, about dealing with dental care in this country. Again, it is an issue that gets almost no coverage. I have introduced the most comprehensive uh, dental legislation uh, in the history of this country, uh, which would make it far, far easier uh, for the American people, seniors and others, uh, to be able to get affordable, uh, quality dental care. Dental care is certainly part of what health care is. Thank you, Senator. We have another question from our online uh, community. And uh, as you uh, know, the, uh, we are facing a crisis with Alzheimer's that is devastating not just to families, but to our healthcare system overall. And can you talk a little bit about what you would do to hopefully aggressively uh, support efforts, research efforts to address this awful disease? Um, you know, one of the absurdities uh, with, regard to Republic, re with regard to Republican legislative priorities is they are very uh, anxious to give huge tax breaks to billionaires. Uh, they see no end in the need to increase funding uh, for defense or go to war here or there or the other place. Uh, but when it comes to research and development uh, for serious medical diseases, Alzheimer's uh, being one of them, uh, cancer being another, uh, somehow or another they think that what makes sense is to cut funding for the NIH and other government agencies that have been so successful over the years uh, in, in developing therapies for serious health issues. Uh, look, in terms of Alzheimer's, not only are you right in saying this is a terrible, terrible disease uh, in terms of what it does to the individual? Uh, but it is also a terrible disease in what it does to the families. Uh, what you have is daughters or husbands uh, no longer able to work full time, 
or are spending substantial sums of money uh, trying to provide care uh, for their parents who are suffering with Alzheimer's. This has a huge impact on the economy, on people's income, both in terms of making less money and then spending more money. So clearly, I think we have to address this issue in at least two basic ways. Number one, you're right. We need more research into the causes of Alzheimer's and doing the best that we can to treat this terrible disease. Number two, we need to provide protection and support for caregivers. I think this is an issue that has not gotten the kind, got, gotten the kind of attention that it, do, that it deserves. And by the way, as our population ages, both in terms of the number of people afflicted with Alzheimer's and the number of, of family members providing care to those who are afflicted, this becomes a bigger and bigger issue, a more and more costly issue. It is an issue we cannot continue to ignore. Thank you, Senator. Uh, one final question from our uh, online listeners. Uh, <coughs> as you know, uh, Social Security beneficiaries pay uh, tax, federal tax, on their, their benefits uh, once they're uh, they reach a threshold of $25,000 per year. That level has stayed the same uh, for over 20 years. And there are a lot of folks, I'm sure you run into them all the time, who feel that there should at least be some adjustment in that threshold, which would in fact reduce their taxes. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, I think if we are looking at a situation that has not been adjusted in 25 years, well, you know what, I think it is time to make some adjustments. So I would agree with those critics who think it is time uh, to make those adjustments. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to repeat them because I don't think you'll be able to hear them, but uh, here's a chance. Yes? Max. Short uh, questions. Okay. Right. Ellie Hollander, Senator Sanders, thanks for being here. Uh, one in six seniors today struggled with hunger. Uh, what would Senator Sanders do as president to address this growing issue of, of senior hunger, isolation, and poverty in America? Well, I am the former. Thank you for that very important question. And again, it pains me that these are not issues that we are discussing anywhere near uh, the degree to what we should. Uh, I am the former chairman of the subcommittee that dealt with the Older American Act. And what I tried to do is significantly expand that act to make sure that we don't have these huge waiting lists for Meals on Wheels, uh, that we increase funding for the Congregate Meal Funding, Meal Program, which is so important not only in providing good nutrition for seniors, but allowing them to come to senior centers, socialize, break out of their loneliness. So I am a strong advocate of the Older Americans Act. Uh, if you check my record, I fought very, very hard to try to expand what that very good piece of legislation provides. I ran into a Republican wall. Uh, we made some modest changes, but much more has to be done. Look, at the end of the day, we judge a nation based on how it treats its most vulnerable people. And that means our seniors, that means our children. Truth is, we are not doing well either by our seniors or by our children. Seniors in America should not go hungry, should not be forced to live on twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a year Social Security. Yes. Uh, Senator, I think as you know, Americans would prefer to age in place wherever possible. Um, and today, it's possible to care for people in their homes in many instances and avoid being placed into a nursing home or a hospital. Uh, and many of us feel that this is a civil rights issue, that people should not be forced in institutions when it really isn't necessary in so many cases. Uh, what would you do as president to encourage greater use of home and community-based health care and long-term care? Absolutely. Look, I mean, this is kind of, uh, from my perspective, a no-brainer. Uh, it's a no-brainer because, as you, you, you've indicated, uh, people uh, would prefer to stay in their own homes. They're more comfortable in their own homes. They know that environment rather than be forced to go to an institution. That's issue number one. It's what most people would prefer, and we should respect that. It is a civil rights issue. Number two, 
as I understand it, it is a lot cheaper to provide caregiving in somebody's home than to institutionalize that person. So you can save substantial sums of Medicaid money, other programs money. So to me, you know, clearly we should be doing everything that we can to provide resources to keep people in their own homes. And I think at the end of the day, we save money doing that and we make people much more comfortable in their own surroundings. Max, maybe one more uh, question. Senator, thank you for speaking with us today. Coming from the great state of Vermont, which has a great track record on end of life care options, I'm wondering what you think that can be done on the federal level to increase end of care options and improve end of care life. End of life care. Well, I, you know, I am proud of how Vermont uh, is a leader, frankly, in, in a number of areas, in, including end of life care. I, you know, this is uh, a very emotional issue, obviously, uh, and we have got to be extremely care careful about how those decisions are made. Uh, and I know the concerns of people who oppose uh, this, but you know, I think uh, if a human being is in a situation where they are going to see their life end in a short period of time, where they are suffering, uh, where they choose no longer to be alive, uh, I think they have the right to make that decision uh, for themselves. And I think that's true, not just in Vermont, obviously, but all across the country. Thank you so much, Senator. I, I just uh, take the uh, opportunity to make a very short comment. Uh, I was uh, with you about 20 years ago at yep. a town hall meeting in Rutland, Vermont. I never heard of Rutland, Vermont, but I was there with you. <laughs> and uh, the only difference between uh, your positions now and your positions then and what you say now and what you said then is a lot more people are listening. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you all. We're going to uh, wrap this up. I just wanted to once again uh, thank the, uh, I think the sound cut out, Julie tells me. So I want to make sure the sponsors uh, that helped us uh, make this possible, AARP, uh, Compassion and Choices, and the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare uh, were acknowledged. And, and I also uh, want to make sure that uh, uh, the, uh, all of you, I wanted to thank all of you for all of the uh, questions that were sent in, uh, and the people that are here. And I especially uh, want to thank Susan Donnelly. And I really like listening to your comments and, and uh, appreciate everything Next Avenue has done to elevate uh, these issues. So uh, I, think we're, I think we're finished. Uh, 202 watch parties in uh, 141 cities in all 50 states. I'm pretty impressed. I hope you are. Thank you all so much.